Eric Darling here with Darling Data, <clears throat> and uh, in this video we are going to talk um, a little bit about uh, NOLOC, or the read uncommitted isolation level. Now, <clears throat> uh, like I said in the, in the initial video, it's very easy to make fun of NOLOC hints. Uh, SQL Server, for whatever reason, uh, aside from Azure SQL DB, is like the only database, the only sane, rational database in the world that does not use uh, optimi an optimistic isolation level by default. Now, it might be a little unclear from a lot of vendor stuff that that's the case. So if you look at vendor documentation, uh, you might just see that their default isolation level is read committed, and you have to dig a little bit further to see that they are using something called multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC, to enable optimistic reads for their databases. This is true of Postgres, Oracle, DB2, just about any other major vendor database that you will use in your life uh, will operate under the optimistic locking semantics. Now, <clears throat> because SQL Server is SQL Server and it decided to do this thing differently, this is the only, this is really the only database platform in the world where you will see endless blog blood spilled over read uncommitted and no lock. Now, this should, this should be telling to a lot of people, but it's not. What people did was kind of the stupid thing. They spent all their time picking on NOLOC. They, they spent all their time castigating people for using NOLOC hints. I'm guilty of this as well. But the problem isn't NOLOC. The problem is read committed. If read committed were a good, reasonable isolation level for the majority of workloads out there, you would not have people running into the filthy arms of read uncommitted and no lock to get away from it. Read committed is the problem. If bloggers and everyone who talks about SQL Server were, were, were smart, they would have spent all their time dunking on read committed rather than no lock and t pushing people towards optimistic isolation levels that solve the problems of read committed without introducing the problems of no lock. But they didn't. And so here we are. Uh, where people continue to this day to, to maintain and uh, to write new blog posts about their incorrect about optimistic isolation levels and continue to belittle people who use read uncommitted and no lock hints without offering them uh, any sort of solution. Like what are they supposed to do? Go back to read committed and have everything be awful and have their read queries deadlock and block with write queries? It's not a good situation. Right? Read committed is the problem. No lock and read uncommitted are not the problem. They're the things that people are, that's the trade-off people are willing to make. They're saying things are so bad with read committed, we're willing to like, in, like risk data inconsistency or just tell people, oh, that report returned you pickles when you should have got potatoes. Just run it again, no big deal. Read committed is the problem. No lock is not the problem. So I've learned to love no lock. And I've learned to love NOLOC as a consultant because uh, as a consultant, what I find is the more NOLOC hints there are, the more money I stand to make. It means your developers need a lot of training. It means the queries and indexes need a lot of tuning. And it means that there are probably some serious bugs in the software. No one with a lot of NOLOC hints or no one using a lot of set transaction isolation level read uncommitted was happy with the way that things were going under read committed. That's why they ended up there. If there were better SQL Server blog posts about snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot isolation, people would end up there. But instead, all they get is a bunch of fear mongering about dirty reads, incorrect results, race conditions, and tempdb. It's kind of it's kind of a nightmare, and I really hate that. Every time I'm trying to talk people into using an optimistic isolation level, they come back at me with like the same th two, three, four links that are all just like various levels of incorrect about, iso about optimistic isolation levels. <clears throat> the only other thing that someone can say to me that will produce the same amount of consulting income as no lock hints is the phrase, we're an entity framework only shop. My wife, and I love her for this, is uh, ble blessedly away from the tech world. She has no idea what these things mean. 
uh, is the darling data social media intern. She uh, has gained some knowledge and insights uh, by doing my TikTok videos and taking these videos and chopping them up, but still uh, blessedly unaware of what these situations are. However, I can text her words like no lock, and I can text her words like entity framework, and, and she knows what that indicates. She knows. She knows. That means she can start shopping. If, if you were to uh, look at my credit score in real time, when she sees those words, you would actually see it drop. It would just be like, every time a browser window opens, the credit score goes down. Now, another reason why I love no lock hints is because no one can satisfactorily tell me what it does. I have heard hundreds of developers from junior to senior to like principal and partner and staff say, it keeps my query from taking locks. And I'm like, ha ha, you fool. You have been misinformed. No lock queries, despite the name no lock, they should, they should, they should the name of this query, the query hint really should have been no respect. Uh, what, what it means is that your query ignores locks taken by other queries. It still takes a lock to prevent certain schema changes to the table, like index changes, column changes, thing, dropping the table, things like that. But it would just ignores locks taken by modification queries. This is where the concept of dirty reads comes from. Now, be, because like when you read data that hasn't yet been committed, you don't know if that data is actually going to get committed. You don't know how far, how far along into the commit that data is. All sorts of weird stuff can happen. Switching gears a little bit, and I want to make sure you get this. These are things that are allowed under read committed. I know that we've been talking about read uncommitted or no lock hints. These are things that are allowed under read committed. You can see the same row twice with the same values. You can see the same row twice with different values. You can miss rows entirely because they get deleted or moved around. And you can see duplicate rows entirely. This is under read committed, the thing that no one is happy with and the reason why people run into the arms of no lock hints. Read uncommitted allows all of those things, plus dirty reads from uncommitted transactions, right? So that's like you find an insert, update, or delete that is in flight or has maybe even finished but not committed or rolled back yet, and you see those changes. You can see partially committed row, row or column data. Paul White has a really interesting post where he's updating uh, a, a row data from all X's to all Y's or something like that. And in, with using no lock hints, you can actually see the partially committed changes where it's like half X's and half Y's. You can also run into errors. And if you go through your error log, you, you might actually have seen these before. If you use my, store, my free store procedure, SP Log Hunter, it will show you when these things happen. But SQL Server will actually sometimes throw errors when you use a no lock or read uncommitted hint and your query and just data has changed too much around your data uh rather sorry data has changed too much around your query to uh, allow your query to continue because the results would be so weird in english that's this one <clears throat> cannot continue scan with no lock due to data movement uh but that apparently there is just a multilingual alliance of people who have who might hit this problem so worldwide uh you can see that there are some things in there that are very far from the typical alphabet you or i might see that that you know there there are things in this in this in this view that say that worldwide no lock is a absolute villain most people most people in the world associate no lock hints with just returning incorrect data to someone. They'll put it on a reporting query, they'll put it in their all their SSRS reports, start with set transaction, isolation level, read uncommitted, and they just go on with their lives and don't care. They're like, oh, this, this report won't take any locks. We'll be we'll just fine. It'll be fast. It's a magic button. Everything's great with no lock. But a lot of people don't think about the repercussions of putting no lock hints elsewhere in queries. A lot of people just associate it with reading data. Not a lot of people associate it with actually committing data into their database. I've worked at a lot of places over the years. There was one place I worked at, and you know, this isn't, this isn't a knock against Redgate or SQL Prompt. This is just the way that this company chose to use Redgate's tool SQL Prompt, is every developer got SQL Prompt and every developer got their, their like SQL Prompt config file. And there was a hotkey combination that said 
with no lock. So you could hit like two keys on your keyboard and every single from, join, you know, where, anything like that, anything that referenced a table, all of a sudden, boom, no lock hint. A lot of people consider it a best practice. It is a worst practice. The best practice to use an optimistic isolation level. The worst practice is to use no lock hints. Let me show you why. So we're going to, uh, this is just going to be mostly all in this window, uh, but we're going to uh, create a couple tables, one called no, one called lock, and these are going to be very simple tables. Uh, and these tables are going to just get uh, one row put in each of them. Uh, you'll see that in the table no, we are inserting the ID one and a null value. And in the lock table, we are inserting ID one and we are inserting, uh, you know what, I think I'm gonna start that over again because I'm, I think I double inserted in that one. So let's just make sure we do the right thing here. Uh, drop table if exists, create table, good job us. <clears throat> and uh, what we're gonna do is put this query into a new window over here. And there are some ghosts of previous demos in this window, that's okay. And uh, then this is gonna be the update query that we run. All right. Now, what you'll, what you'll notice is that this update query has a no lock hint in this part of the join clause. <clears throat> Up here, we are updating the table no, right? This, this is the table no. It is being aliased with the letter n. And so we are updating n. This will create a lock on the table no. When we join to the lock table, it's going to have a no lock hint so that the reads done here will happen in the un read uncommitted isolation level. So if we come over to this window, and let's just make sure we don't have anything weird or icky going on in here, we're already in the right database. So all we have to do is begin a transaction and run this update against the lock table now. Okay, so we've started a transaction, we've updated the lock table, and we have an open transaction over here. Because this query, is using a no lock hint and running an update here. Now, the sort of magical part about this query is I'm using the output clause to show you what, what values end up being put into the, uh, into the, into the table when, when this update runs. If we run this update, we will see the uncommitted version of that other, uh, the update that we had in the other window where this thing has temporarily shown the big int max. Now, a lot, like I said before, a lot of people only associate no lock or read uncommitted with potentially returning dirty reads or incorrect results for select queries. Not many people associate it with like queries like that update where you have a no lock hint against a different table from the one you're updating because you obviously can't no lock the table you're modifying. That's just not how locks work. But we read dirty data from another transaction and now we've committed dirty data into our database. Imagine this was happening for a database where something like this would really matter. You wouldn't be very happy with that, would you? Because now you've got dirty, re you, have, you have data from a dirty read committed into your database. Who's gonna see this? I don't know. Imagine if you had a bank account and one day uh, you woke up and you, saw that that was, and you saw that your account balance was this. You might run right to the bank and you might ask for cash or a check or as much money as they could to cover this balance and close that account out immediately, right? You just say, oh, well, really? That, that's all my money? I'm taking this $2.1 billion elsewhere. I hate this bank. How dare you? And I, I don't know, maybe you would be right to do that. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe you would get away with that because that's what, that's what the bank said your account balance is. Whose fault is it? Well, Banks using no lock hints, dirty reads. I don't know. Who's who, is, is that? Is that really your fault for saying I want my money? This is the money you say I have. Personally, I mean, I might. I don't know if I would actually try to withdraw the money because you know, even though I am a consultant, I do fancy myself being somewhat ethical. But I would probably close out my bank account on the spot because any bank that would accidentally commit that much money to me is not a trustworthy bank. <laughs> All right. Something is bad with that bank's database queries. Uh, something, 
where they credited me with that much money and I should not never have seen that much money in my bank account. So <clears throat> when you're using no lock hints, um, you know, you might, you might say, 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 say things to yourself like, it's fine, uh, it's just a report query, it's fine, uh, like nothing else is updating the table data anyway, in which case I might say, if you have no concurrent modifications, why do you need no lock hints? It's, it's a weird question. But uh, if you are writing no lock hints into your inserts, updates, and deletes when you touch tables other than the ones that you are inserting, updating, or deleting to, or even if you're doing like an insert where not exists or something, or exists or update this with a join or an exists or a subquery, and you put no lock hints into those, you can end up committing crap data into your tables. And then it's up to you to f audit that and figure out the who, what, where, when, why, how, and then fix it. And you better have something in place that track the previous versions of those rows or, or else what do, you, what do you set it to? How do you, how do you undo that? It's crazy. It's a bad situation. So again, no lock, read uncommitted, same thing. Not a best practice, not a good idea. Read, read committed though is the problem. If read committed were a better isolation level, people wouldn't need to do stuff like this. The best practice is if you need to avoid the bad stuff from read committed, the locking, the blocking, the deadlocking between read queries and write queries, but you want consistent, uh, correct data for your queries, you should be using an optimistic isolation level instead. So anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned something. I hope that you will take this information into the great SQL server blue yonder and start informing people of just how bad the no lock read uncommitted situation can be. But you need to start by empathizing with them about read committed because read committed is just a whole ball of pain and optimistic isolation levels save that pain without introducing things like this. So, yeah, that's good. I've been talking for a while. Let's, let's, up, let's, let's upload this one.